Okay, so we've been talking about land acknowledgement and the importance of understanding wh where we're at and who came before us in order for us to really interrogate like our own implicit bias, our past, why we think what we think. So that's kind of where we're at. Now, I know you guys are like, man, look at the time and I cannot believe it, but it's a lot to cover. Anti-racism is not one of those things where I'm just going to tell you and you have to agree with it. It's where you have to arrive to the understanding of truth. That's what anti-racism is about and why we talk about race so much in the United States of America. But when you start to understand the complicated past of indigenous people and colonization in the United States of America, then you will begin to understand why race is, plays a huge role, okay? So I'm just gonna break it down for you short because the 1619 Project goes into great detail, but I'm just gonna give it to you in bite size. So here's a bite sized piece about why race is always talked about in the United States of America. So here it is. In order for, in order for there to be freedom or what people perceive to be freedom or who deserve freedom and rights privileged to land, okay? Europeans came over here and they began to colonize. And that's when they drove out indigenous people, Native Americans, Indians. You know, people uh, look at have different identities for themselves, and not all Native Americans say they're Indian, and not all Indians say they're Native American or indigenous, and it just depends. But for this sake of this conversation, I'm going to use the term indigenous, so you understand where the grouping comes from. Okay, so indigenous people, meaning they were here first. Some people don't like the term Native American because they were here first. America didn't exist, so it's very important that you understand that. Indian sometimes for some people is very derogatory because of the way that that term came about. So just understand, sometimes the best term to use is indigenous when we're talking about this, like fact setting. All right. So when Europeans came over here to escape the tyranny that was going on over in Europe, I'm breaking it down for you real simple. They came over here because they were looking for freedom and they wanted to have freedom. But guess what? The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So the same, the very same thing that they were running from, they became the monster. They started to create it. We're going to talk about the pedagogy of the oppressed. Some of you may know that, Pablo Fierro. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. If you're not careful, you become the very hate that you are fighting against. That's basically what happened in the inception of the United States of America. So they came over here, they drove out the indigenous people, and they put them in internment camps, and they called them reservations. They said, you could live here, and you could do this. That's it. And then they recognize, well, now we need, we need to build up these places. Washington, D.C. was built by slaves and slave people in the transatlantic slave movement, African-Americans that were kidnapped and brought over here against their will. Now, were there some that made some deals and came over here and some of the chiefs of the tribes in Africa made deals? Sure, some of that happened too. But most of it was without choice, not by choice. People kidnapped and drug over here against their will and rights, and they were brought here in order to work for free, okay? And how the past has talked about the transatlantic slave movement and what we've been taught in the United States of America at times, we're taught that people were um, what we call indentured slaves, meaning they were brought here to work towards having their own land, right? So they were indebted to their slave owner, like an employer and they were working for their land. Some of that's true, most of it's not true, okay? So what happened was you had people get kidnapped, brought over here because in order to have a capitalist nation, which is all about power and privilege and hierarchy and classism, you have to have free or very, very low class working poor in order to have really wealthy people. So that's it in a nutshell. Now. 1619 Project goes into a lot of detail about that. Why is that important? Because we, as the United States of America, we also have dirty hands. A lot of times we go over and we get involved in different conflicts around the world. Some of that is because, you know, we are America. And although we are a great country, we're also a capitalist nation, okay? And we, it's, it's all about money. It, it truly is, it comes down to privilege and power. So in saying all that, it's a lot more complex than saying all people that look like this did this to my ancestors and all people that look like that did that to my ancestors. Because believe it or not, there were African-Americans that owned slaves. A lot of people don't know that. Sad but true, okay? Because it came down to money, privilege and power. Money, the love of money will get you to do a lot of things and take you out your character. All right, so there's the rundown. There's a rundown. Now, why is this important in being anti-racist? Because we have to constantly 
fight against what race looks like in America and what it means and that it shouldn't be attached to dissemination of resources, but still is. In the census, job applications, going to college, you will see, check mark, check mark what nationality are. They call it nationality. It's really ethnic identity, but it is what it is. They say, what's your nationality? And you have to check mark it. Some people will tell you that's for funding reasons. Oh, it's to be funded. But when it all comes down to it, it's about power and privilege. Some people will say, oh, well, that's so we can track who's really getting the resources. That's why we need to know that. When it all comes down to it, it's power and privilege. Now, is there some truth there? Sure. There's always three sides to a story. Your side, my side, and the truth. Usually we don't get to the truth because people don't want to suspend their ego enough to perspective take. So it's hard to get to the truth. All right. So here we go. Any questions? What questions do you have or contributions right now about what I just said? And I know I gave you a quick rundown, but it's important you understand that. Anybody have any questions right now? Or anything to contribute? Okay. All right. Kim, let me know if I miss anybody. Real do. Okay, so here we go. A dream without movement and without people will never exist in reality. That's so true. So what we're talking about for me, the dream is that we can all be free. We can all be free regardless of where we come from, not, not ignoring who we are, where we come from, but letting that not stop us from coming together and uniting. Also, what is your dream? That's important for you to know. Like, what is your dream? You got to have a dream. And I think it's really important for everybody to have a dream ongoing for the rest of your life. Because dreams build hope and hope builds peace. Because when you're in a place where you're at peace, you can think clearly, right? You, you're able to really, what I call vision cast. You can think about these big, huge ideas and how you can be a part of something really great. So when we talk about anti-racism, we're talking about you being great. And when you're great and I'm great, we come together, we all are part of something really great, purposeful, mindful, working towards a unified, you know, world really that we're just acknowledging humanity first and we're always putting humanity first so now what's your why so i hope you have your pen and your paper out and after i've been framing kind of out what we're talking about i want you to write down your why not what's your major i don't want you to write down what you mean because a lot of times we get caught up in what we're majoring in okay but the reality is you're complete right now and you're an expert in your own life, okay? And what you bring to the table, your lived experience is part of your why. And if it's not, you got to figure that out. And I want, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you to know that your why has to be connected to your purpose. And when you get your why connected to your purpose, you can be propelled to do greatness. So you got to know your why. You got to know why you're here. You, you write, the talking about human geography, you got to know why you're here, what brought you to this place today, okay? It's beyond extra credit, right? It is beyond extra credit. Now, hopefully you're getting a deeper understanding. What really brings me to this place today? There's something in me that I feel a void or something in me that I, I, I need this. I need to understand how we all connect. And we're going to talk about that because it's very, at times it can be so challenging to understand how we belong with one another when we are so different from one another but we're more alike than different. If we practice humanity and we constantly put humanity first, we will always get to a place where we understand our why, collectively understand our why. All right, so here we go. Got a little video for you. So I'm gonna mute myself, make sure you guys can hear the sound. All right, I'm gonna mute myself so I don't distract from the video. How do I know? A lot of people, when they think of the phrase, how do I know, they always want to put the what behind it. How do I know what I'm supposed to do? The, the question that you really should ask is, how do I know why I'm here? Because when you know your why, your what becomes more clear and more impactful. If you know, like for instance, um, people know that I do comedy, but that's what I do. My why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. So I can do comedy, I can write books, I can be in a movie because all of it is motivated by my why. In fact, I have a new, uh, a new web series out called Michael Jr. Break Time. 
uh, we probably just did the sixth episode. It's on YouTube. So every single Wednesday at 3 o'clock, we drop a new episode on YouTube of Michael Jr. Break Time. What it is is it's me. I travel around the country, and I do stand-up comedy, in case you didn't know. <laughs> and in the middle of my comedy set sometime, I'll stop and just talk to my audience. And we've been filming this, and it's, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. So we're in Winston-Salem. I'm going to show you a clip from Winston-Salem. And I'm just talking to this guy in the audience, and he tells me that he's a, uh, a musical instructor at a school. So I was like, all right, you're a musical instructor. You know, can you sing? Let me hear you sing a song. So this is what happened at the last episode of Michael Jr.'s Break Time. Check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right, so um, let, me get a couple, let me get a couple bars of, like, uh, Amazing Grace. Can you do the first part of that? Let me, go ahead. Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow. That bro could sing. You know what I'm saying? All right, all right. Uh, now, what you give me the version is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid, I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved. Okay, um, here's what I want you to catch. The first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what becomes more impactful because you're walking towards or in your purpose. All right, so here we go. I know there's always some reactions to that. I love that. I show it all the time because I absolutely love it. When we're really purposeful, we know where we come from. We understand our what, you know, what we want to change, you know, that makes sense. But when we really know our why, you know, when we really know why we're here, you know, why we think the way we think, we really get that you get to that place where you're living really purposeful. Okay, so looking at the past must only be a means of understanding more clearly what and who you are so you can move wisely, um, wisely build the future. So that's Paulo Fierro, which uh, the author of Pedagogy of the Press, which is an incredible read. It's very dense. I've read it several times. Um, I, I try to read that book every couple of years. It was a foundational book for me. It was a shift in my master's program. I really started to understand, you know, um, the trauma I had experienced, how to interrogate my trauma. And, but I also understood the power of forgiveness and forgiving myself, um, forgiving others, forgiving people who will never acknowledge they did anything, um, forgiving people who hurt my ancestors in order for me to get to a place of true liberation. Uh, that's the heart of an anti-racist, is being able to talk about the past, being able to understand how it influences my why, but also not holding a grudge and not turning into that, the very, the very monster that I'm fighting against. And so 
I think that that's really important for us to understand because we're going to watch some other videos today as we start to go through it. Some emotions will come up. Some emotions may have already come up is what we're talking about. I don't want you to stuff your stuff that down. I want you to write it down. I want you to draw, doodle some pictures, how you're feeling, because it's important for you to know how you feel. You need to acknowledge how you feel and you need to be okay to, to, to feel the way that you're feeling because it is painful to know, you know, what everybody in this space has gone, gone through things, but it's also painful to know why we're all here as Americans, right? Why we're all here. If, if you're documented, if you're undocumented, you're here. And, and the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, you're afforded the same rights, whether you're documented or undocumented. A lot of people don't know that either. But once again, we've been taught a lot of different things because that looks like privilege and power. And everybody here is a human being and everybody here deserves love and respect. And so we just wanna be knowledgeable of our past so we don't repeat it for the future, but also to know your why. All right, Kim, is there anything coming up in chat I need to be aware of? No, not so far. Well, Yadira said she absolutely loves the video. Uh -huh. All right, so here we go. Here's another video. This is important you guys know about the 1968 East Los Angeles walkouts. We have to know that where we're at, the land that we reside on, we have to understand our past. So here we go. The East Los Angeles high school walkouts of 1968 were a pivotal moment in the Chicano movement that demonstrated the power of student-led protest. Thousands of Chicano students refused to attend the segregated and poorly maintained Mexican-American schools that they had been forced into in an attempt to illustrate their resentment of the blatant shortcomings in their educational system. Mexican-American schools at this time were segregated facilities furnished with low-quality learning equipment, inexperienced teachers, and most unjustly a curriculum that focused on teaching of industrial and domestic skills. This type of backwards education almost guaranteed the Mexican-American niche in labor positions, preventing Mexican-American social mobility. The student walkouts of 1968 were a physical manifestation of the frustrations felt by young Mexican students in America and helped to reveal the beginnings of the social struggle for equality and recognition of Chicanos by a new generation of youths. This student movement, however, drew influence from prior events that dramatically impacted the effort for civil equality of minorities. These events included the Watts Riots and the Great Boycott of 1965. An interview with Moctezuma Esparza, a key figure in the student walkouts, highlights the origins of the walkouts and provides an explanation for the frustrations of the Mexican-American youth. Esparza notes that there was a very small group of people who organized the walkouts and created the Chicano Civil Rights Movement, but they ignited a firestorm that was ready because that anger was below the surface of thousands and thousands of students. In other words, the walkouts began with the ideas of a minority group of students with a background that granted them the ability to organize the movement. But the movement drew its power from the rallying cry of the thousands of other students and youth that felt this way but were uncertain of how to express their frustration. When asked about the most prominent injustices he faced going to school in the late 60s as a young Chicano, Esparza recalled, there was the obvious social injustice of living in the country as Chicanos and Mexicanos, all being programmed to become laborers. None of us were being programmed to enter college. There was a realization that the dropout rate was not our own failure, but that of the system, which pre-programmed us. The failure on our part was we bought into it, and we accepted that was all we could do. Chicano youths felt that their tailored education system was confining them to a life as laborers, a position that many generations of Chicanos before them had filled. These youths realized that their chances for social mobility were minimal considering they were withheld a proper education that would avail them social advancement in higher education. So, rather than stay in school, they dropped out and accepted the jobs for which they had been programmed. However, with the surge of anger at their dismal academic conditions came the realization that their failure was not the problem, but rather the system that was setting them up for failure. Chicano students no longer allowed the status quo of the population to claim that they were doing the best they could for a population that really didn't have what it took to succeed, 
but force them to look at the blatant faults within their own educational system. These faults are highlighted in the list of demands proposed by the students to the East Los Angeles School Board. These demands were to be presented to the Los Angeles Board of Education with the expectation that school officials would immediately respond and agree to their petition. The demands were a representation of the injustices and mistreatment that the students tolerated within their high schools. The proposed demands revealed the lack of resources and attention provided to Chicanos by the school officials. A general trend of the demands was the need to be culturally recognized as Mexican-American and the necessity to eliminate discrimination by school officials. One of the demands included a direct request for bilingual education. Bilingual bicultural education will be compulsory for Mexican-Americans in the Los Angeles City school system where there is a majority of Mexican-American students. This demand demonstrated the students' desires to have a learning environment that was culturally and linguistically relevant to their lives. Among other demands, students asked for the inclusion of a curricula that would relate to their cultural experiences, stating, Textbooks and curriculum will be developed to show Mexican and Mexican-American contribution to the U.S. society and to show the injustices that Mexicans have suffered as a culture of that society. Textbooks should concentrate on Mexican folklore rather than English folklore. As well as, student body offices shall be open to all students. A high grade point average shall not be considered as a prerequisite to eligibility. These demands exhibit the diminished cultural recognition of Chicanos at the time and reveal that blatant discrimination they experience daily. Ultimately, the East Los Angeles High School walkouts of 1968 were a bold response to the societal oppression that Mexican Americans faced throughout their daily lives. In the wake of these student protests, emerged a critical conscious Chicano community that continues to strive for equality in our present society. Okay, let's get some thoughts here. Who knew about that? Raise, raise your hand if you knew about that. And it's okay if you didn't. Isn't that interesting? So I think it's, and I'm, I'm really wanting people to understand the importance of knowing where you're at, where you reside, where you come from, and why it's so absolutely important, right? So absolutely important that we understand that because that's going to help Really, I feel, for me, it helps encourage me that people before me have been doing this work and I'm not alone. And that also we can do it. We can all stand in solidarity with one another when there's issues that arise because that's truly what it means to be an anti-racist. And so it's why we talk about anti-racism a certain way is recognizing too that race is such a determining factor. I'm gonna keep saying this over and over again for the dissemination of resources. I mean, we're talking about uh, redlining, we're going to go into redlining too, but I'm going to give you all like a little break right now. But redlining, what we talk about with redlining is um, how neighborhoods are structured was all part of a, to segregate people. A lot of people don't know that. So when we, you go into different parts of Los Angeles County and you'll see pockets of neighborhoods, you know, all Hispanics, all Blacks, that's all very intentional. Now being a realtor, I learned so many things. I was shocked, like just not just about redlining, blockbustering, you know, some a lot of uh, real estate agents still do it today where they'll only show certain clients, certain spaces, and, and they'll try also to get people to move out of certain spaces. If they feel like there's a lot of minorities coming to a community, they'll go into that community and try to get people that are Caucasian to come out and say, hey, you know, the neighborhood. There goes the neighborhood, too, too many minorities moving here, and just to keep that segregation going on. And then what happens too is communities, they price out minorities. And, and, and we're not just talking about, first of all, let's be clear, race is a factor too, but class is a huge factor. So people who are middle class or poor, white women too, suffer and struggle with this, and middle class people suffer and struggle with this, and they'll price people out of home ownership. I'll give you an example of Menifee, California, where I live, an hour north of San Diego City, San Diego County. Um, this is really interesting for you to know this. We had um, a townhouse, me and my partner, out in Hawthorne, California, right? Uh, we bought it for $180,000. Uh, 
It was part of a revitalization grant. And within five years, it, it, I sold it for over half a million dollars. Five years. Okay. One of the best real estate moves I've ever done in my life. I recognized I wanted a different life. I didn't like the high crime area that we were living in. One day I came home from the preschool I was at and there were police cars lining our street and there, were, um, there was a homicide in our closed community, within our gates, in that community, there was a homicide. And I was like, I cannot do that. I want to raise my kids here. I want to get away. So anyways, so we bought a ranch out here in Minifee. At the time, this ranch, two acres. Anybody knows what two acres is? In, in Los Angeles, this ranch would be $7 million, probably more than that. This is just ridiculous how expensive it is out there. But about four or five, going to be five years ago, I bought it for $435,000. The house right next to me, three weeks ago, sold for almost a million dollars. Almost a million dollars. People are being priced all out of Minifee right now. So now brand new built in Minifee, $750,000. Five years ago, those houses were $350,000. That's it. So this is what happened, same in Santa Clarita. Right, so Renee knows because I remember when Santa Clarita was coming up, it's the same thing, but it's all it has to do with redlining. It's all very strategically done, okay? So I'm gonna give everybody an eight minute break because I know we've been going through a lot, okay? You same say? in Los Angeles, right, Cat Catalina? Same, in eight minutes. Let's give everybody an eight minute break. Catalina so had um, something to say, I think. Oh, go ahead, Catalina. Oh, no, I was just agreeing with you. Like, this is so true. Like, um, knowing your history, knowing everything before, you know, just just uh, jumping onto conclusions, like saying, oh, you've been right. But know the history. Like, I always tell my kids, even kids I tutor from out of state, from over the country, like, know your history. Know who you mm -hmm. are. Be comfortable in your own skin. And I would just, it was just like, this is true. Know your truth and be comfortable. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. So yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely necessary. So, okay, this is what we're gonna do. Um, come back at 11.50. So it gives you nine minutes. So take a bio break, get, get whatever you need and we'll see you soon, okay? Yeah, there you go. Get some Doritos, whatever your choice is. <laughs> I'll be back too. Should I stop the recording, you think? Okay, I'll stop the recording.